Welcome to Literary Hangover. I'm Matt Leck. With me is Alex Guns. Hello. And Grace Jackson. Hi. So today we are talking about Afroben. Uh, that's how we're pronouncing it, right? Yeah. And her work, which is, uh, I don't know if we'll call it the first novel. I, th- I think that we'll talk about that a bit later, about the case that could be made. Uh, but Orinoco or the Royal Slave. Uh, a bit of a polarity there. Uh, y- what are your guys' relationship with Afro Ben? Grace, do you want to start? I had heard a lot about Afro Ben when I was doing my literature degree, but I never actually read much by her. A lot of people at the time were really drawn to her poetry, which is known for being somewhat bawdy and kind of kinky, and so was becoming a little bit trendy, I guess, uh, when I was doing my degree around the mid-2000s. But I had never read Orinoco, which is this kind of proto-novel, and I heard an episode of Good Old In Our Time Mm -hmm. and thought it sounded really interesting and kind of somewhat ahead of its own time in terms of the themes that it's treating colonialism brutality and the kind of burgeoning slave trade in the 17th century so. yeah it's sort of the triangle slave trade before um like one of the uh, supplementary articles i read on this is like this the, the actual first triangle voyage hadn't happened yet although the mm. origin like there's obviously activity happening in all the three points on the triangle but but it it like prefigures that in a pretty amazing way mm-hmm. um yeah I've, I've never read any of her stuff until now but it, she's cropped up in different like british history books especially about the glorious revolution as like the cultural response to that kind of uh intense moment in british political history and she's kind of thought of as like a cipher of that moment in a way that like Shakespeare would be a cipher for like Elizabethan England. E- yeah, the, so she's of the, she's of the Restoration period. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so she's her biography. I guess we can play a little bit from in our time to get into that. But uh, how do you think of the Restoration? Um, how do you guys think of the Restoration? Like basically, my impression of this coming from um, just studying through the lens of Afro Ben is like a brief time where monarchy was back, and also theaters back, and so it's like a the, like the re- relationship between the state and sort of psych like entertainment and uh, psychological operations basically to like make people happier with the current like who the current governance or whoever's in charge um i mean wh- what do you guys think about that i guess you can read it as a time of like the return of the repressed you know the things that were not allowed um, previously, uh, after the execution of Charles I, I think there's something in Afro Ben's work that is very decadent and very indulgent, whether it's to do with bodily pleasures or this kind of almost reveling in violence that we get in Orinoco, which we'll get into later. There's like a sort of sense of excess in this period, mm. and that gets manifested in literature and on the stage as well with these very kind of like high drama restoration comedies full Mm. of like you know um comedy and mirth and sex and yeah that's kind of how i read the period um but there's a lot going on in this time i think there's definitely a high level of confidence that's reflected in the in this work and works of this time and when we look at it now it does seem like it's the final victory of what would be the Church of England, that it's no longer up for grabs. Like, if it's, is it going to be a monarchy or not? Is it going to be like a Puritan Republic or not? That it's kind of gone back and forth since the Tudor period. And the Restoration is like, we're a monarchy. And the Church of England is going to uphold this monarchy. And what the monarchy does is going to, like, obviously be curbed in the coming centuries. But it will be there and it's going to be a staple of uh, English culture. Until Jez wins, and then it's all up for grabs. <laughs> but I think you don't want to underplay also how much anxiety there is in this period, and there's a lot of things that are unresolved. Yeah, will yeah. not get resolved until, I mean, the beginning of the next century, I guess. Well, it's interesting yeah. how much, and we'll get to this um, once we get to in our time, but how reacted against Afro Ben was after her time Mm -hmm. as like overly body and corrupter of morals. Uh, Mm -hmm. um, Okay. Let's get to in our time. 
Hello, Afra Ben was a prolific playwright for the Restoration stage, a poet, a writer of fiction, and a sometimes spy, and her life spanned one of the most turbulent times, turbulent times in English history. She was born as the Civil War started in 1640, flourished under the restored Stuart monarchy, and stayed loyal to James II after the Glorious Revolution, right up to her death in 1689. And she was the first English woman to make her living from writing. As tastes changed, she was dismissed as too bawdy, but Virginia Woolf wrote, All women together ought to let flowers fall upon the grave of Afra Ben, for it was she who earned them the right to speak their minds. With me to discuss Afra Ben are Janet Todd, former president of Lucy Cavendish College, Cambridge University, Ross Ballister, Professor of 18th Century Literature at Mansfield College, University of Oxford, and Claire Bowditch, Postdoctoral Research Associate in English and Drama at Loughborough University. Jan Todd, how much do we know about Afra Ben's early life? Well, not a lot. But she was clearly humbly born. Um, we think that her father was a, a barber in Kent. Um, she was born into this tumultuous time, as you've already mentioned. Um, and for the rest of her life, she had a horror of um, civil strife and Puritan rule, the notion of a government that has to control behavior and morality. Um, her mother appears to have been a wet nurse in a more elevated family, and I think it's probably through that connection that she gets to know a man called Killigrew, who, when the rest restoration comes, um, is both involved in the uh, Secret Service and in the theater. And, of course, Ben comes into history first as a secret agent. But in terms of her childhood, Germaine Greer said we must be prepared to live with what we do not know about her early years. That is what we are doing, I think, mm. rather substantially. I hope one day there will be more yeah. known. But it isn't, is it sure that her father was a barber in Kent? It seems to be more sure that... Melvin's very annoyed at how little you can actually oh. pin down about Afra in this uh, episode. He's so exasperated. He, he's so exasperated at any kind of, like, divert... If you're not getting, giving him hard facts, which, yes, yes, but come on now. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a part, and I think we play it, but uh, we're talking about Suriname, um, and he's, he's like, but you all seem to doubt it in your books, and it's true, actually, um, that I probably would have uh, cast more doubt on it uh if I hadn't heard them talk about it in in our time, what that she went there, that she went there, because mm -hmm. in the book it's like, yeah, we uh, th there are parts where it's like, yeah, we don't actually have any f knowledge, and that does stick with you. Mm -hmm. But it turned like they all seem to accept it anyway. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, my mother was a wet nurse, doesn't it? I think the barber bit is is pretty secure. It's all circumstantial because it's um. She's not born into the kind of family that keeps letters in the attic and that has a big house where they can control and hold their own archives. So it's not surprising that very little is known. And the fact that she is constantly referred to as humbly, someone humbly born, I think, is, is fair enough. But what I think is almost more important than exactly what her provenance was is where did she get her amazing education? She well, you... is obviously an autodidact. She obviously makes a great use of everything and everybody she knows. And she's just a very, very clever girl. But nonetheless, she learns how to write in all genres. She learns how to comport herself among the learned, among, among men who are the ins, at the ends of court. She learns all that somewhere. That was the question I was going to ask you. Yes, Where well, did she learn it? Well, please don't. <laughs> I don't know. We, all so I can do is speculate. Madeline. And I think it's to do with these connections that she makes. Uh, Somehow through the wet nurse, she got into the libraries of one or two great big yes, houses with, with libraries and I think she took to reading did. books. And I think that's she the best we can do, is it? <laughs> I think it's the best we can do. I think that's a lot. Yeah, I, think a lot. I mean, a lot of people who are very clever can get there through their wit. Um, and I think the other thing is it's a period in which women could do this, um, the period in which women could, um, who are clever, witty, and, and pretty as well, um, could actually rise and get to a position where they could hobnob with people with, of learning and education. And this is in the terrible Civil War period, yes. the masses of deaths, and, and then in the Cromwellian period. Uh, just a couple notes on her education. Um, it's mentioned in uh, Janet Todd, who's uh, who's one of the guests in this uh, in our Times piece. Also wrote a book that I uh, 
Uh, have you read This Grace, A Secret Life by Afrobin? I read little bits of it. Yeah, yeah it's pretty good. Um, and uh, she t- points out a couple times that Afra took solace in the fact that Shakespeare wasn't from high birth or uh, and was sort of self-educated um, when her plays started getting uh, shit on for those reasons. Yeah, uh, I like that she also emphasizes the like material conditions of her life. Um, apparently, Afra Ben was constantly poor. Mm-hmm. And just always trying to make money and like make ends meet. Yeah, even her spine didn't earn her money. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, she had to, she had to go to the theater to do that. The best thing in that episode of In Our Time is when Melvin Bragg's trying to make them give examples of how of like boardiness, boardiness, yeah. And he's like, "Come on, it's early, but we'll get through." <laughs> <laughs> He's like, but exactly what kind of boardiness? I mean, we have examples from Orinoco, like not maybe not bodiness, but like sexual explicitness. That like, yeah, over yeah, over a hundred men wanted to sleep with uh, Amoinda. Oh, Amoinda, yeah. yeah, the very the fifteen-year-old. Yeah, some strong uh, Epstein. That's right. We're about to cancel her right now. <laughs> and there's that scene where the older woman is. She sleeps with Orinoco's right hand man, uh-huh. and he's doing that as a favor to Orinoco so that she'll grant him access to the princess. Yeah. It's really like very boring. Like sex traffic and the slave trade, mm-hmm. basically, is God. what this uh, Orinoco's about, but we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to In Our Time. Period of what was called the Commonwealth and so on. And she's doing that then, but we do know she was a spy in we Antwerp. We do know that for well, sure. Well, you're on your own, Jan. Where she go? How did you get to be a spy in Antwerp? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's something I was going to be asked about her, her theatrical world. But um, I think she was already a spy when she went to Suriname, which is an amazing place for a woman to go at that time. She went there when she was about 20, um, basically. A little bit after. Um, and I think that because she was already being called Astrea, which was her code name later and her theatrical name. And in Suriname, she also met a William Scott, who was a dissident, a Republican, and an enemy of the king. Um, and when she was definitely a spy in Antwerp, codenamed 160 and called Astrea again, she was sent there. just want to put a marker in this in uh, like actual spies writing fiction because that's going to be a common uh, theme or or just johnson intelligence services in general Mm -hmm. um being spies well they're professional liars so exactly makes sense Uh, i mean that's it's it's yeah (laughs) (laughs) to bring in this william scott and make him turn And in Suriname, she also met a William Scott, who was a dissident, a Republican, and an enemy of the king. Um, And when she was definitely a spy in Antwerp, codenamed 160 and called Astrea again, she was sent there to bring in this William Scott and make him turn into a double agent so that he would would work for the um, government of Charles II. And we've actually letters and reports and how she yes, we have saying, her I need more money to do she this job. She wrote endlessly <laughs> about needing more money. And I think all through her life, most of her letters that we have are asking for money. Rose Ballister, what was the state of the theatre when Ben began to write? Did she write? Did she say? How, why did she begin to write for the state? Well, as Jan said, it's, it seems likely that it's this connection with Thomas Killigrew. Um, we know that in her novel that she publishes in 1688 called Orinoco, um, Jan, um, Afra Ben mentions that she sent some Indian feathers from Suriname to Killigrew to the King's company for a performance. Um, this, so I think she has connections with the stage. And I suppose what Jan's outlined here is a situation where she clearly wasn't making money through the other careers that she tried. Spying wasn't working. Um, and, um, and she doesn't seem to, she doesn't seem to have been a very effective spy. Um, so I think she turns to the stage to try and earn money. Um, she probably looks at models like John Dryden and Thomas Shadwell, who were um, the rising professionals in the stage at the time. I think it's worth understanding what the theatre's like in this period. Yes, because it had been closed down in 1642. Exactly. It, closed- it opened up again, but only two theatres compared with the massive theatres there were in, as it were, That's Shakespeare right. and post-Shakespearean right. world. And, it's an and entirely, it was very different. Yeah, can you tell us about how different, different kind it was? Of theater. Like? I mean, lots of people sort of say, this isn't just a revival or a restoration, it's a reinvention of theatre. Um, 
Charles II does two things that are very significant. He gives two patents to two companies that are called the Duke's Company and the King's Company. Killigrew runs the King's Company. Davenant runs the, the Duke's Company. Most of Be- all of Ben's plays until 1682 are performed by the Duke's Company, interestingly. So that's James, named after James, Duke of York, later James II. And he seems to have been um, the member of the royal family, the monarch that Yeah, but ben how did the theatre the theater came back as a different thing? What different thing was it? Okay, so it's it's a patent theatre. It's owned by those yes, uh, managers. Again here. Whereas previously yeah, but it's they were stock with companies. Women can play women. <laughs> well, the second part, in his second, um, in 1660, well, a few years later, um, Charles passes an edict that says all parts for women must be played by women. And interestingly, he says that because he says otherwise, um, there are scurrilous and obscene passages that are given to female parts. So he's saying actually that he's going to make the theatre more respectable by having women play these parts. Mm-hmm. Our impression is, of course, that this, beca- this is a kind of enormous novelty and excitement, seeing women playing female parts on the stage. Yeah, so it's interesting, like the theatre comes back as like sort of two monopolies run mm-hmm. by, like, uh, allowed by the state. Um, and the same guy gets Afra into spycraft and the theater, which is like, I don't know, it, it's... Well, it makes sense of her role as basically a political propagandist right. mm-hmm. on the stage and uh, to an extent in her poetry and maybe in Orinoco. It's like how the Iowa's Writers Workshop was funded by CIA money. Exactly. See, these are the themes. Really? Yeah. We need to find a sort book on that and do that. Cause like, There's one that just came out. Yeah, uh, I've heard about Cold War, like that. Cold War Culture War. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, like this is... And, I mean, look at fucking Jack Ryan. The John, <laughs> like Jim from The Office yeah. uh, is going to save us from uh, Venezuela nuking us with Russian missiles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, thanks, Amazon. <laughs> uh, Amazon, who, by the way, does the servers for the CIA. Mm. This is uh, this is it, right? Like this is this is really what I want to talk about all the time. <laughs> like, <laughs> Intersection between state power and art. Uh, this is why I love Thomas Pynchon, right? Mm. Like uh, this is basically like uh, you know Mason and Dixon, uh, the, like the empires b- driving behind all this scientific experimentation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you, I mean, Gravity's Rainbow and Crying a Lot Forty Nine. Crying a Lot Forty Nine is all this kind of like what is the Mechani- what is the force behind all this and there's like implied CIA stuff to that and mm-hmm. it's almost terrifying how long of a through line that is mm-hmm. uh, yeah. don't don't challenge uh, the restoration of the monarchy because women are playing women now <laughs> go look at the babes guys yeah. really enjoy that let's move a bit into uh, Afra's career when she gets sort of going and Melvin sort of wants to know, is she sort of a, could she be considered a female libertine? And mm. there's one rebuttal to that, which is like, like, there's an absolute difference between men and women because, you know, men, uh, can't get pregnant. Um, but other than that, like the lifestyle Afra is, uh, living, I guess we'll go through it here. And I think Ben clearly identified with that and wanted to be seen as, part of that libertine circle mm-hmm. those um young court um thrusting cavaliers round um charles who were challenging convention challenging rule um uh, saw themselves as a new young generation um taking over from the old um commonwealth men now manifested as parliamentarians um and there's a very strong kind of libertine ethics or ethos. One way to put it is to sort of say, you know, Ben pursued a career in writing, not she wasn't a kept mistress. We know very little. If she was, she kept that hidden. So it's in her writing that you see this kind of libertarian um, energy (laughs) rather than in her life. What place did marriage play in that scheme of things? She's always very sceptical about marriage. Most of her plays um, concern young women who are, or the majority of her comedies concern young women who are unhappily contracted to old men um, and want to get back to their young (coughs) lovers who they've um, been separated from. So let's just be more specific. She isn't against marriage. She's against young women being unhappily contracted to old men. Yes, yes. But she's also, um, I mean, she is against marriages because it's an institution, if you take this libertine ethic. So she has a kind of, Ben's an odd 
odd combination of idealism and pragmatism. So she has this longing for a golden age, a world in which there was no marriage, no contract. People give love freely. She often idealises that, but she also said, you know, she has a poem called The Golden Age in which all of that is idealised and then right at the end we realise this is all spoken in the voice of a man who's just trying to get a woman into bed with him. So this libertarian language she understands is something that rakes use to try and get women into bed. But come back to the... Sorry, Jan, but can I just pursue this one more time? But the idea of a female rake, which I mentioned earlier, mm. which which I, I've seen in the notes of some one or one or two of you, was 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 not something you wanted to pursue. Was not something she wanted to pursue. Well, I think when you think about the character of Helena in the Rover, mm. there's a wonderful point when Helena says to um, Wilmore, "I'm Helena the Constant, and he, uh, Helena the Inconstant, and you're Robert the Constant." And there she's sort of saying. I'm inconstant in the sense I can keep making myself into a new character to attract you and keep your attention. Whereas you, the, the, the supposedly the manifestation of the rake, Wilmore is actually a bit of a bore who's completely driven by his sort of sexual appetites. He's constantly looking for another woman. So she's the one who has the kind of flexibility, mobility to reinvent herself, make herself into a new kind of character, the sort of freedom that the libertine as an ideal might have. And then we're, we're living in a time of acquaint- at least an acquaintance, perhaps even a friend of hers, Nell Gwynne, who was very open about her status. Yes. I think, I think Ben wants to differentiate herself from actresses. I, I mean, I think she really wants to be part of this court wit group rather than one of them identified with yeah. the actress. I, I just wanted to come in on the um, idea of the um, ethical liberty mm. because I agree with Roz on that very much. And one of the most extraordinary things about Ben is that she um, goes against religion and mm. very, very few women of the time could set up for almost for atheism in the way that she does. She writes poems where she talks about faith as feeble um, she says that that Christianity is is the last shift of routed argument. Um, she even writes a paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer, in which she says, "I haven't had enough daily bread, actually, and I'd like <laughs> some more." And as for trespasses, well, you should give in to them. Good heavens! Um, Oscar Wilde foretold. Yes, I mean she she is extraordinary in that respect, um, and she. Um, very much admires the uh, the classical philosopher Lucretius, um, mm. whom she reads in translation. Um, and Lucretius thought that the world was all made up of, of shifting atoms, and so that when a person dies, then um, he or she just becomes a, a series of, of atoms floating off into the air. So there is no afterlife. And Ben clearly did not believe in an afterlife. It's interesting to me how, you know, I spent a... a a while listening to sort of secular podcasts, um, like, like, uh, I forget actually some of their names now. Um, it's been that long, but where they'd interview people and they, and they, they occasionally get little, little Adams was one of the better ones where you can hear about like history of like Giordano Bruno, mm-hmm. um, people who were, uh, the sort of free thinkers, but Afro Ben never came up in any of that stuff. Maybe she did, but it just went over my head too. That could be my fault. But like, What's weird to me is she um she's also a bot thinker, right? Like she's a prop- paid propagandist for the state, but like mm-hmm. she's allowed to have a lot of freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh I I I'm in the most anachronistic amount of it. Uh I don't know, it's it's hard for me to understand how exactly she was allowed. Um Yeah, I I guess I have trouble with defining her as a free thinker as mm. such just because I see her much more as someone who's riddled with contradictions that are basically unresolved. And there is a kind of freedom in that, in that she's able to be, in some ways, like a feminist, in other ways, a royalist. She's kind of, I feel like she stumps for patriarchy in Orinoco mm-hmm. as well. Right. She's definitely on the side of like a kind of progressive vision of aristocracy and like feudalism as opposed to mercantile capitalism like there are all these kind of tensions within her that i think root her in her in her time but also yeah prevent me from seeing her as someone who was like totally free in that right i guess i just think of it in terms of the god question like is she an atheist but didn't she have like 
wasn't she kind of Catholic curious? Yeah, as well? and actually, one of the guests said she was like, in, she was okay and down with like the bells and smells exactly. of Catholicism, the ritual aspect. Uh, and if it was, yeah, if if it was just the ritual aspect, she could have been down with it. Um, uh, but it was, I think, when it gets into like governance, she's sort of like a sort of an anarcho monarchist or something like that like it's very it, it's it, her politics are very strange actually we can we'll get into yeah. a little bit more of that here club club Burdage. um she was a very strong supporter uh of the of the Stuart monarchy of charles second for 25 years and then of his brother james she was. even though he was uh, um opposed by a great number of people in the country uh and and i think maybe one or two of our listeners might think a very strong tory mon- mon- monarchist tory loyalist fascinated by the court dazzled by it really and a very strong can we call a feminist without stepping on everybody so can we just use it to be getting on with mm-hmm. feminist which is okay, more of a slightly <laughs> different oh no <laughs> What would you have to say about that? Um, I think that, indeed, we, we as critics of Ben, tr- struggle to reconcile these two, in one sense, very progressive ideas for her time in terms of her championing of women in the public sphere and her really quite staunch royalism. Uh, you know, they seem diametrically opposed. Uh, in a sense, she's quite clever in how she does reconcile these two things, though, um, because what she refrains from doing is looking back immediately to the Stuart line, if you like, um, in order to contextualise her support for both Charles as a Protestant, or at least a public Protestant, and James as a public Catholic and his heir presumptive. Um, What she does instead is support them in what might be thought of as quite feminine terms. Uh, So, for instance, she praises them as fathers, both, you know, fathers of their, in Charles's case, illegitimate sons, and fathers of the nation. So she couches that in domesticity, really. And she also looks back, as as Jan was saying, to to the classics and their the the kind of classical heroes are used in place of support of the monarchy uh, or support specifically of Charles or James. So her support works on really two different levels, I think, one on a quite learned level and one on quite a domestic level. Did the court repay her devotion to them? Um, We don't have any specific record of favours that were given to her, for instance. In 1681, she did dedicate one of her plays, the second part of the Rover, to the future James the uh, James II and one might assume she was in some sense remunerated for that whether financially or through some kind of court favour um, but I think if she'd received any kind of gratuitous favour she would have been satirised by somebody and we would know about that so I think it was probably proportional to either the work that she was doing or what other people were receiving uh, before we get to the second part of that, um, it's funny that th- they mentioned the second part of the rover coming out in 1681. The first part was 1677. Afro Ben was a big uh, sequelizer. Mm. Uh, so, like, part two. Uh, so you gotta make that money. I mean, and that is obviously economically driven, right? Mm-hmm. Um, just as same as it ever was. John, you want to come in? Uh, I was just going to say that I, exactly, we don't know, but towards the end of her life, she was such a propagandist for James II, mm-hmm. and very few people were as loyal as she was at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a feeling that she was paid at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, she's always short of money, so you can never really tell from the fact that she's short of money that she isn't being mm-hmm. paid. But that that slew of, of, of propagandist poems at the end, um, all printed by the King's printer, mm-hmm. I would have thought that she was at that point being paid by the government of, of James II. Wasn't there a suggestion when she was in Antwerp as a spy that she was actually sent to seduce that guy? Um. Like that her, you know, her method of turning him into a double agent was through the... Uh, Erotic arts. Not sure. I'll have to, <laughs> I mean, if you're a spy, you got to get you, you're a problem solver. Yeah, and uh, a femme fatale of sorts. Yeah, I'm not sure. I I, I want to read the uh, 
Yeah, I'm not sure either. The I uh, Janet try. Todd book on it a little bit closer. Um, we do plan to do a second episode. Um, Speaking of sequels. Yeah, exactly. Uh, going to sequelize that for Ben. Um, I think she's worth it. Um, uh, she, uh, The Widow Ranter, which is a Bacon's Rebellion sort of uh, take, which is very interesting. We'll talk about the ranters. Is that the one set in Virginia? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very interesting, but, uh, I don't want to get, uh, off into that. Uh, we, today we're talking about Orinoco or the Royal Slave. 1688, uh, prose fiction. Uh, in some ways, I think you can make a case for it as an early version of a novel. People say Robinson Crusoe, which is, comes about 30 years, 30, 40 years later. Mm-hmm. But this, uh, this, uh, the word novel actually is in the, uh, text um uh so you can see it's starting to come into uh into usage in this time period the only uh, argument against it is its length right that's what people are basically get are yeah stuck in their craw about yeah it's, it's short fiction 100 pages yeah it, i mean which i appreciate um <laughs> yeah uh thankfully um and also this idea that it belongs more to the genre of travel narrative mm. like old world people in the new world Right. Mm. That was a thing. Right. It, it, what's interesting to me is how it comes off, or, um, and I think this is mentioned, I don't know if in this source or not, but she w- would tell it at parties. This was an oral story. She was, uh, would tell at salons, and then one day she just wrote it all down. Uh, yeah, there's, there's ideas that this was written in one setting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She says that in the dedication, right? Yeah. Which, like, it can kind of, it's not, it, sometimes it's like, yeah, right, dude. This yeah. one, it's like, I maybe. can kind of see it. Yeah, yeah, maybe. The shifting perspective definitely makes me think that it's like, there's there wasn't necessarily a, a, like a strong plan going into it, rather than just like, I'm going to do this, and then this. Right. And apparently this version uh, could, didn't quite capture how good she was at telling it in real life. Oh, really? Hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess it, the length thing, I guess, like that seems kind of pedantic for is it a novel or not, when we consider the essence of this piece which is quite fixated on like interiority of these characters and like what motivates Mm. them to act and it's like if you were to to define a novel to me that's like the primary definition so it's like beyond question that this is at least a proto novel yeah um actually and like the characterization of the first person narrator as Mm -hmm. well as being possibly unreliable feels very modern yeah yeah what's interesting though is like first novels how like those early novels now are all postmodern, <laughs> considered postmodern. like don quixote is metafiction or something <laughs> like that. right exactly that that is, is i think very revealing um there's this uh this guy william smith who English did a uh, youtube video i'll give some uh shine to orinoco and the rise of the novel i think he's a, a professor um, although he doesn't name his class in this, so um, you know, you can, I'll, I'll link to this uh, thing though. But uh, he talks about this English exact thing. There are other medieval romances that we have that are written in prose. In fact, most scholars would argue that the novel form developed from the medieval romance, not just in English, but also in uh, French and other European languages. But those same scholars would still draw a distinction between a romance and a novel. In fact, in the 17th century, these two terms both existed. Roman, meaning a romance, romance, or novel, meaning a novel. And they existed side by side, but they referred to different kinds of works. So what is the difference? What is it that that separates the novel form from the romance form? What is it that makes it new or novel? Well, these distinctions aren't as clear today because novels, in fact, take a lot of different forms in the modern world. But in the 18th century, we can say certain things about novels. Uh, They were, for example, distinguished by realism. Uh, Novels were about ordinary people doing relatively ordinary things in the ordinary world. Whereas medieval romances, things like Havelock the Dane and Sir Gawther, are clearly about extraordinary people. Uh, They tended to be about, for example, kings and emperors and great heroes, and the things that these people did often could not, or at least did not usually, exist in the ordinary world. Now, this distinction is actually pretty important, because most historians uh, agree that the rise of the novel in the 17th century is 
tied in some way to the rise of the middle class in England at the same time. The idea being that in a world that was becoming more and more defined by these very ordinary people with ordinary lives, that uh, works like the romance uh, with these extraordinary heroes doing extraordinary things didn't resonate in the same way that a work about ordinary people would. Literary historians also believe that the rise in the novel form is tied in some way to the rise in popularity of other literary forms, specifically journals and diaries that were becoming very popular during this time period. They probably started, to be honest, with the diaries and journals of explorers in the late 15th and early 16th century, the journals of Christopher Columbus and a lot of the explorers who followed. And actually, Afra Ben participated in that. She wrote Love Letters to a Gentleman, um, which is another uh, version of that. Um, I, I think, like, if you talk, the difference between a romance and a novel uh, is kind of, like, a bit clarifying, I thought. Mm-hmm. And and how Orinoco is sort of um, a little bit between the two, maybe more of a romance, but you have the noble character of Orinoco, who's very, like, high-born like to the point where he does he has european features even though he's black yeah. um by the way this is a very this is a definitely very racist uh work of prose fiction um uh and uh, but it's also the way that it, um there's description of bringing something new to you like literally that word um and uh, obviously, colon- the age of colonization happening at the exact same time. I think, uh, like, you're gonna see. I mean, I think w- this is just a good example of. Oh, this is what's driving a lot, of, like, I- interest and imagination. Is I don't know. What do you and discovery? Yeah, right. The the age of discovery really aided by like the culture um, that is available to it. Yeah, and I think that the plot of the novel where this prince becomes a lowly slave you could say is then like a blending of both the romance and the novel at that time because it's about exceptional people and everyday people yeah and they they talk about like robinson crusoe how you describe the scientific um surroundings of it and that's exact that's in this too Mm -hmm. um she does that for extended periods of time describing like armadillos and um snakes and stuff like that Mm mm-hmm um, as well as like a sort of anthropological eye on the native population, uh, which we'll get to um, soon here. Uh, let's go to back to the inner time folks talking about this. During this conversation, it's been taken for granted that she did go to Suriname in Southern. Do you all take that for granted? Because it's doubted in your in your notes whether she did whether or not she. Well, did I think go critics there. have doubted it historically. They doubted it, um, and there's. Well, you three, this, you can all say alleged, not unproved, well, and we, so on. Well, we can't be absolute because we haven't found a diary saying here I was in Suriname. But um, there's a huge amount of circumstantial evidence that she was there, and if she wasn't, a woman remarkably like her was there, mm. also calling herself Astrea, which is mm. after all the name she uses all the way through. I mean, there are states papers that mention the women in Suriname. And it Why did you go her. to Suriname in the first place? <laughs> well, aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> we don't know, but I think she went as an agent right away. But oh, it's right. only still in the, spe- still in the secret yeah. service. It's only yeah. speculation. I mean, she says her father was given a job as lieutenant yeah. governor of the island. That yeah. seems like- How about be less mad at historians, Melvin, and be more upset at the, the spies? Mm-hmm. They're, they're, that's what's making it. I like his antagonistic approach to podcasting. It's though. great. It I, be, I feel like we should go after you more. Or like, <laughs> I'll just attack Grace for no reason. <laughs> yeah, it's. Come I, on, what I is respect it? it a lot. Like, get out with it. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Unlikely if he was a she, barber. Well, she always she gets herself into her own works. Her, her works are really faction. She often puts herself into what she's writing, mm-hmm. and when she does that, she nearly always elevates her birth. So, to come back to this novel mm-hmm. itself, what's most striking about it from the background? Um, I mean, it's a remarkable novel, uh, and it's it's much studied now. I think probably because it's we there's a debate about the extent to which it's making a case against slavery but at least one might sort of say that it's a it's a a novel which exposes the kind of savagery at the heart of colonial government in that respect you could see it as as presaging a a novel like heart of darkness like marlowe in heart of darkness the the narrator is a character in the novel who is is complicit with the english colonial government that she's also 
criticising for its cruelty to this noble African prince that it, who has been enslaved. He leads a slave rebellion. It's put down. Um, he's horribly tortured, murders his wife, and then he's publicly executed. And his um, courted parts are sent around the colony. Um, she finishes saying this mangled spectacle of the king. Um, it's, re- it's recalling again Charles the first murder. So it's a wonderful kind of mixture of contemporary allegory and analogy and um, contemporary critique of the colonial situation. Still on the other side, as it were, um, of, of, the, of the ocean, not of the life itself, Claire. Uh, there's another light play, The the Widow Ranter set in Virginia. And uh, Widow Ranter is the other one that we'll talk about later. But uh, yeah, I think that sets us up for Orinoco uh, rather well. I, I think as a early version of Heart of Darkness... Mm. Uh, that is a, that's a very interesting parallel for me to draw, or for them to draw, because, like, it is definitely, uh, it's still a very racist book, but it does show the sort of, like, there's certain, uh, things that it had, that it details, uh, that show that there was a consciousness about slavery in the sense that, like, they would, one, separate slaves, like, you didn't, if you were enslaved with, say, uh, somebody you knew in Africa, there you were being split up, because, mm-hmm. just as a, basically, like, riot control, mm-hmm. um, and rebellion control, um, that's mentioned here, uh, in this, uh, it's, it's also mentioned that, like, this dynamic of slaves getting promises from their masters for their freedom, and then not believing them, uh, and then basically Orinoco takes that as a, a mark against Christians in general. Mm-hmm. Um, like that, that to be having that in a work of prose fiction in 1688 is a pretty amazing thing. Um, uh, in my eyes. Well, there's a remarkable level of like cultural relativ- relativism that's going on in this novel that you would not expect of that time. And in much later dates in like this country, for example, were almost non-existent in fiction. The idea that like, like uh, uh, a slave had any kind of interiority, an African slave at that, or could be at the same intellectual level of uh, a European is basically taken as granted in this novel, whereas like race theory in the United States up to and including the Civil War would be like absolutely not. But I think there are some questions about how far race was like essentialized as a category at this point in history. And I don't think that she's necessarily in that moment. Like, I think it's a little early for that. And there is this idea that like, of course, this is a racist novel there are racist discourses throughout it but there is a way in which it's not quite as um i don't know what what, how to put it yeah like the discourse around race science wasn't nearly as crystallized well blackness isn't inherently bad at this point yeah yeah um i mean that's uh what we know about like anti-blackness is a product of the slavery in the americas and that was just starting to kick up at this point Um, but it is amazing how you can see how that groundwork is there like she's um or an oak because this she basically dismisses race science in in a way um in favor of her sort of noble spirit science right yeah well the way i read this book actually is as uh, as a book that's much more about class than about race definitely that it's Mm. it's the central violation at the heart of this book is that this noble man has been enslaved it's not that a black man has been enslaved right it's that someone with europeanized features a european education european manners this kind of classical context has been dragged this low yeah know? yeah and that's why it's like almost the case of like it's a cultural nationhood instead of a racial one right because orinoco's orinoco himself is a slaver like he sells people yeah. he uh, yep, defeat yep. in battle uh to the slaver who eventually enslaves him yeah um he also is fascinated with the english court or the european courts uh, so there's like a sort of like he recognize like that that's still European superiority if it's not white supremacy at this mm-hmm. point. But I would say in the in the prose of this and from her narration, there's explicit critiques of uh, a Eurocentric worldview that to say that like he is the so-called savage, but in Europe it's she basically compares it negatively to like uh, Christian humanism. Mm. Like mm. she sees that as an exhausted form of thought and like 
from my reading any, anyways, like Orinoco is part of this like new burgeoning, like elite of like enlightened people like him and his master later on. Like they're people that have somehow transcended the backwards view of Europe as well. Right. Well, and, yeah. And Orinoco himself is like, when he's the prince, he's meeting with advisors about mathematics to be better at war, basically. Mm-hmm. And, uh, then he basically, uh, and he, and he himself has a slave that he is just his sort of mental companion too. And then eventually Orinoco gets put in that position. But let's, let's actually start with, uh, some of the uh, book here read by Elizabeth Clett. Yeah. The God, <laughs> uh, back at it. And uh, we'll just start off with the the opening here. Part one of Orinoco. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Record- we will get right off the bat, though. She distinguishes in fairly uh, racist ways between the native populations and the African populations. Yep. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Orinoco, or the Royal Slave, by Afra Ben. Part one. I do not pretend, in giving you the history of this royal slave, to entertain my reader with adventures of a feigned hero, whose life and fortunes fancy may manage at the poet's pleasure, nor in relating the truth, designed to adorn it with any accidents, but such as arrived in earnest to him. And it shall come simply into the world, recommended by its own proper merits and natural intrigues, there being enough of reality to support it, and to render it diverting, without the addition of invention. I was myself an eye-witness to a great part of what you will here find set down, and what I could not be witness of, I received from the mouth of the chief actor in this history, the hero himself, who gave us the whole transactions of his youth, and though I shall omit, for brevity's sake, a thousand little accidents of his life, which, however pleasant to us, where history was scarce and adventures very rare, yet might prove tedious and heavy to my reader, in a world where he finds diversions for every minute new and strange. I love that, because there's already an annoyance of how easily distracted people are, and how easily available distractions and stimulus are, mm-hmm. and it's fucking 1688. <laughs> like, what are people doing? Like, Well, we, we've outlined all the, the ancient, or the, the fun that people have at that time. I assume yeah. a rocking chair is around. I think yeah. blowing bubbles on a rocking chair. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, people can't even focus um, anymore. Checking yeah. out their cabinets of curiosity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> all their trinkets. Works are translated now into their own tongue, so they don't have to learn Greek, like, which is, you know, basically just like, are you even reading it at that point? Yeah. <laughs> Playing marbles was like the modern Call of Duty Modern Warfare of yeah, 16 that's what most historians would say. Yeah. <laughs> But we who were perfectly charmed with the character of this great man were curious to gather every circumstance of his life. The scene of the last part of his adventures lies in a colony in America, called Surinam, in the West Indies. But before I give you the story of this gallant slave, tis fit I tell you the manner of bringing them to these new colonies, those they make use of there not being natives of the place, for those we live with in perfect amity without daring to command them. But on the contrary... That's obviously a stretch, but it's interesting to me um, <laughs> that this is exactly like why this text, Orinoco, will be studied for like as long as there's an academia is because of how it opens and the themes it touches on, mm-hmm. right? Like, that's exactly what we are interested in about this time. Yeah. There's, like, slavery and exploitation and sort of the a growing racial otherization and stratification of people. And it starts out right off the bat with fundamental myths about, like, oh, we have this labor force that we're forcing uh, to work with us. We're going to leave the natives because they can, like, um, help us exploit nature better. Um, yeah. Well, that's why it was such a good choice, I thought, that Grace picked, because it's just one of many books that we've covered that blows a hole through, I feel like, common understanding of the past, which is if horrible things were happening in the past, there was no prevalent critique of those things. People Mm. just didn't know. Right. And in reality, every critique we have of the past, of any past institution, also seems to have existed at that moment. 
yeah. and in quite popular fashions, like in plays and in books. Right. And that's the scary thing about our time period now yeah. is we're aware, of, like we, you, you think it's just raising awareness, right? Mm-hmm. Or things about that. And like, no, it's power, motherfucker. Like <laughs> have power. That's how you stop the bad things from happening. It's not like making sure people know about it. That helps. Yeah. But that's only uh, that's only like raw material for it. Um, the original title. This is raising awareness of the slave trade. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, but it's like all this stuff going on right now, and this is literally this stuff is written in the shadow of coups and monarchy restorations, mm-hmm. and uh, same thing with the Salem witch trials, right? Like the, all this is cultural. Uh, going on at the same time, all this is sort of a cultural, there's a cultural storm being caused by what's going on yeah. in, with actual power. And these are, these sorts of artifacts are what, like the, uh, these, uh how it, like the fossils of it, basically. Mm. Hmm. Caress them with all the brotherly and friendly affection in the world, trading with them yeah, so with here, imperfect amity. Without- here, here she is about how well we treat uh, natives, which amity. is maybe not the. She, she's less than perspicacious. Uh, yeah, not a hundred percent accurate. Yeah. You the manner of bringing them to these new colonies, those they make use of there, not being natives of the place. For those we live with in perfect amity, without daring to command them. But on the contrary, caress them with all the brotherly and friendly affection in the world, trading with them for their fish, venison, buffalo skins, and little rarities, as marmosets, a sort of monkey, as big as a rat or weasel, but of marvellous and delicate shape, having face and hands like a human creature, and coucheries, a little beast in the form and fashion of a Okay, yeah, so you get some sort of naturalistic writing there, which is uh, interesting. Um, and and how she's like this is a true story uh, mm-hmm. when it's obviously not. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, right from the beginning, people knew how to sell. Uh, and now we get move on to uh, where the, she just frankly uh, speaks about why they choose to enslave uh, Negroes, as she puts it. They will shoot down oranges and other fruit, and only touch the stalk with the darts. This is about how good Native that Americans they may not are. hurt the fruit. So that they being on all occasions very useful to us, we find it absolutely necessary to caress them as friends, and not to treat them as slaves, nor dare we do other, their numbers so far surpassing ours in that continent. Yeah, wait for that. Those, then, whom we make use of to work in our plantations of sugar are negroes, black slaves altogether, who are transported thither in this manner. Those who want slaves make a bargain with a master or a captain of a ship, and contract to pay him so much apiece, a matter of twenty pound a head, for as many as he agrees for, and to pay for him when they shall be delivered on such a plantation, so that, when there arrives a ship laden with slaves, they have so contracted go aboard and receive their number by lot, and perhaps in one lot that may be for ten, there may happen to be three or four men, the rest women and children." or be there more or less of either sex, you are obliged to be contented with your lot. Coromantian, a country of blacks so called, was one of those places in which they found the most advantageous trading for these slaves, and thither most of our great traders in that (coughs) merchandise traffic, for that nation is very warlike and brave, and having a continual campaign, being always in hostility with one neighbouring prince or other, they had the fortune to take a great many captives, for all they took in battle were sold as slaves, at least those common men who could not ransom themselves. Of these slaves so taken the general only has all the profit, and of these generals are captains and masters of ship by all their freights." The king of Coromantian was himself a man of an hundred and odd years old, and had no son, though he had many beautiful black wives, for most certainly there are beauties that can charm of that colour. So, before we hear more about his wives, it's th- that thing about how um, Coromantian, this uh, um, black, black colony, or black empire that um, sells slaves, the way it talks about how they've they fight they're always fighting with other tribes around it's it's it sounds exactly like how we talk about um Afghanistan or like Libya now like Libya has slave markets right now mm-hmm. and the the way that people salve their consciousness is about um 
But like Austin Gaddafi is say, well, they've been fighting over there forever. Yeah, it's like, like into Nissan. So yeah, exactly. We are absolved. Yeah. It's like I can't. Which is like that's just throwing your hands up. That's the right and saying like I'm like the children are fighting amongst each other. Yeah, I, and I mean it's so easy to do. That's uh, that's why it's done, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, or like like they're all bad essentially. That there is like like we can't have any allies in this region because they're all. The unspoken word is that they're subhuman, I guess. But also there is a discourse, I think, in this book where you have this idea that power and might and military force prevails and that that is a kind of natural order. It's like a Hobbesian idea that if you conquer another tribe by force, then yes, you have the right to enslave them. It's not that you are divinely ordained with that right. It's just that you've you've defeated them yeah it's rules yeah. so yeah i guess that's like a major theme of this novel is like this idea of honor and like yeah. this definition it's chivalric, of honor. yeah it is yeah and without yeah that's interesting to i didn't make that connection but it's like orinoco is like yeah he's like that kind of a hero like a sir gawain yeah uh, mm-hmm. or beowulf almost when he's in the later parts of it or hiawatha hiawatha like yeah yeah um, that, it, that's that that's where that romance um influence comes from yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's like the same logic that governs a duel, like a knightly duel, like who overcomes whom and like you can enslave that person. What makes Ornoko a hero in this, it seems like, is not so much what happens to him, but how he deals with it. Yes. That like there's all these factors that are happening to him, like becoming a slave or his betrothed is taken away from him. And it's not, you know, that he avenges himself or has like a like a rising up which all of these things occur it's the fact that he takes it in stride <laughs> for the most part which makes yeah. him an honorable person and he continues to believe his captors which mm-hmm. is like one of his kind of biggest mistakes i feel like his credulity mm-hmm. he's constantly taking people at their word until or, or the very Noko. end yeah where he's yeah. like actually i've learned my lesson yeah, yeah yeah well i mean he starts getting skittish about it once his kid once uh well we don't want to spoil too much but once uh a he's he's expecting a child he begins to think like you guys have been telling me i'm gonna get free once like you talk to such and such and i not really buying that um Mm -hmm. uh, but uh let's start let's get going a little bit and hear about the king of coromantian and uh his uh his many wives which orinoco everybody else is uh is uh um Oh shit! What's the word? Uh, polygamist mm-hmm. uh, in the area, but not Orinoco. He's no. a monogamist, just a good guy that likes to hear about English court. Or, he's uh, the original European good guy. courts. Yeah, he's a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh. In his younger years, he had had many gallant men to his sons, thirteen of whom died in battle, conquering when they fell, and he had only left him for his successor one grandchild, son to one of these dead victors who, as soon as he could bear a bow in his hand and a quiver at his back, was sent into the field to be trained up by one of the oldest generals to war, where, from his natural inclination to arms and the occasions given him, with the good conduct of the old general, he became, at the age of seventeen, one of the most expert captains and bravest soldiers that ever saw the field of Mars, so that he was adored as the wonder of all that world and the darling of the soldiers. Besides— He was adorned with a native beauty, so transcending all those of his gloomy race, that he struck an awe and reverence even into those that knew not his quality, as he did into me, who beheld him with surprise and wonder, when afterwards he arrived in our world. He had scarce arrived at his seventeenth year, when, fighting by his side, the general was killed with an arrow in his eye, which the prince Orinoco, for so was this gallant Moor called, very narrowly avoided— nor had he, if the general who saw the arrow shot, and perceiving it aimed at the prince, had not bowed his head between, on purpose to receive it in his own body, rather than it should touch that of the prince, Badass. and so saved him. T'was then, afflicted as Orinoco was, that he was proclaimed general in the old man's place, and then it was, at the finishing of that war, which had continued for two years, that the prince came to court— where he had hardly been a month together, from the time of his fifth year to that of seventeen, and it was amazing to imagine where it was he learned so much humanity, 
or to give his accomplishments a juster name, where twas he got that real greatness of soul, those refined notions of true honour, that absolute generosity, and that softness that was capable of the highest passions of love and gallantry, whose objects were almost continually fighting men, or those mangled or dead, <clears throat> who heard no sounds but those of war and groans. Some part of it we may attribute to the care of a Frenchman of wit and learning, who, finding it turned very good account to be a sort of royal tutor to this young black— So, a uh, European education here for Arnaco. —leaving him a very ready, apt, and quick of apprehension, took a great pleasure to teach him morals, language, and science, and was for it extremely beloved and valued by him. Another reason was, he loved, when he came from war, to see all the English gentlemen that traded thither, and did not only learn their language— but that of the Spaniard also, with whom he traded afterwards for slaves. I have often seen and conversed with this great man, and been a witness to many of his mighty actions, and do assure my reader, the most illustrious courts could not have produced a braver man, both for greatness of courage and mind, a judgment more solid, a wit more quick, and a conversation more sweet and diverting. He knew almost as much as if he had read much, he had heard of and admired the Romans, he had heard of the late civil wars in England, and the deplorable death of our great monarch, and would discourse of it with all the sense and abhorrence of the injustice. And There's a bit of that uh, subtle propaganda work there, the deplorable death of our late monarch, mm -hmm. just, uh, just to lock that down. <laughs> I think this might be a stretch, but just reading this um, passage, I think you can find like a very deeply buried identification between Afroban and Orinoco, just given what we heard earlier about how she was educated but not high-born, like this idea of the sort of surprisingly well-educated outsider, like, oh, where'd you learn that? And she's like, so bright, yeah. Right, he, he, he knew almost as much as if he had read much. I feel like that could be a mm. self-description for her as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah, like she, pr uh, she like praises some order, just an order that isn't seen yet. Yeah, like an order of I don't know what you call it, like some sort of like meritocracy almost. Yeah, spiritual merit. Yeah, meritocracy. And Orinoco talks about like hating this, this like seen empire, but he is like king of an empire that's not recognized yet. Yeah. So there's, some, and I think she would probably identify with that as well. There's like latent nobility. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's a funny mix of meritocracy and aristocracy, I think. Well, it's almost like... worldview. It's almost like it's the dialogue around the Enlightenment before it happened. Like, I feel like that idea is crystallized later on, like, uh, two generations later by, like, like the Jeffersons of the world that are, like... Uh, I don't know if I know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> I feel, I feel like, like I'm she's, kind of, she's pretty I'm critical of the Enlightenment in this book, though. I think she's critiquing the, like, emergent mercantile capitalism that's going along with the age of reason and those sort of, like, proto-enlightenment ideas. Like, the guy, the slave trader, um, or the captain... Yeah, we'll get who, to him. Sorry, who seduces Orinoco with the globe and the map. Yeah. yeah. I guess I mean, like, the idea the of this like, this, like, unseen group of people that are connected. Like, this, what is it, the the... What's that called? Like the Nation of Letters? What the hell is that called? Republic of Letters. Republic yeah. of Letters. Like, it seems like that kind of thought process before the, there's verbiage for that. Mm -hmm. He had an extreme good and graceful mien, and all the civility of a well-bred great man. <laughs> he had nothing of barbarity in his nature, but in all... This is also, like, in The Spy... Um, the the character of like George Washington, like he, he he's trying to put on a disguise. Oh yeah, but you can just tell he's so great. He's such a great person. Like it's yeah. ridiculous that yeah. he would be disguised as something lesser than. Points addressed himself as if his education had been in some European court. This great and just character of Orinoco gave me an extreme curiosity to see him, especially when I knew he spoke French and English, and that I could talk with him. But though I had heard so much of him, I was as greatly surprised when I saw him as if I had heard nothing of him, so beyond all report I found him. He came into the room, and addressed himself to me and some other women with the best grace in the world. He was pretty tall, 
but of a shape the most exact that can be fancied, the most famous statuary could not form the figure of a man more admirably turned from head to foot. His face was not of that brown, rusty black which most of that nation are, yeah. but of perfect ebony or polished jet. His eyes were the most awful that could be seen, and very piercing, the white of them being like snow, as were his teeth. His nose was rising and Roman, instead of African and flat. His mouth the finest shape that could be seen, far from those great turned lips which are so natural to the rest of the negroes. The whole proportion and air of his face was so nobly and exactly formed, that baiting his colour, there could be nothing in nature more beautiful, agreeable, and handsome. There was so yeah, like the the color prejudice is definitely already there. Mm-hmm. Um, if the uh, we're still waiting for the sort of race science of the capitalist era to solidify it. There's no one grace wanting that bears the standard of true beauty. His hair came down to his shoulders, by the aids of art, which was by pulling it out with a quill and keeping it combed, of which he took particular care. Nor did the perfections of his mind come short of those of his person, for his discourse was admirable upon almost any subject, and whoever had heard him speak would have been convinced of their errors, that all fine wit is confined to the white men, especially to those of Christendom and would have confessed that Orinoco was as capable even of reigning well, and of governing as wisely, had as great a soul, as politic maxims, and was as sensible of power as any prince civilized in the most refined schools of humanity and learning, or the most illustrious courts. So this is a... a, um, This happened a couple times, where a passage that has been deeply racist has actually, from its perspective, been arguing for a more tolerant viewpoint. Right. I'm going to reify all these things we think about um, uh, your physical appearance and race and what that might mean for like innate intelligence. Uh, but there's people that might have Roman noses and be really smart from those uh, other other cultures. I think we've called that the Longfellow trap. Yeah, <laughs> yes, the Longfellow. We should do a. Actually, that's. A, we think about maybe doing some video content, and that would be a good. We should do little concepts like that. Yeah. <laughs> You just you, you you can't go all the way. You end up getting. Uh, you piss off people who think you're racist and people who don't think you're racist enough. Yeah, you you don't please the constituency you're appealing to. Yeah, the, the Longfellow trap. Yeah, this prince, such as I have described him, whose soul and body were so admirably adorned, was while yet he was in the court of his grandfather, as I said. As capable of love as twas possible for a brave and gallant man to be, and in saying that I have named the highest degree of love, for sure great souls are most capable of that passion. I have already said the old general was killed by the shot of an arrow by the side of this prince in battle, and that Orinoco was made general. This old dead hero had only one daughter left of his race, a beauty that, to describe her truly, one need only say she was female to the noble male, the beautiful black Venus to our young Mars, as charming in her person as he, and of delicate virtues. I have seen a hundred white men sighing after her, and making a thousand vows at her feet, all in vain and unsuccessful. And she was indeed too great for any but a prince of her own nation to adore. Orinoco, coming from the wars, which were now ended, after he had made his court to his grandfather, he thought in honour he ought to make a visit to Amoinda, the daughter of his foster-father, the dead general, and to make some excuses to her, because his preservation was the occasion of her father's death, and to present her with those slaves that had been taken in this last battle, as the trophies of Okay, so he goes to present Amoinda with some of his slaves. Uh, we don't. We're gonna lay out, um, you know, c- cut out of the narration a little bit there. Um, basically, Amoinda, this amazing beauty, uh, and him agree that they should get married. Uh, do we, how much of the plot do you guys want to talk about, or should we just kind of summarize it for a little bit here? I want to get up to the part where he's uh, enslaved. Um, okay, yeah, I'll do it. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, and you want to do a summary? Yeah, I think unless you guys had parts, I didn't want to gl- um, gloss over anything you wanted to get deep into. But Orinoco's grandfather, the king, decides he wants Amoinda yep. instead. And uh, he's about to take her. 
uh, physically. And she's like, well, I'm already promised to somebody else. She makes some excuses um, to try to not say who she's promised to, but it later turns out it's Orinoco. Um, but then she tells him that we haven't consummated it. And he's like, we'll come into this bathtub, basically. Uh, I think, actually, I have that line. Um, he sends her the royal veil. Yeah, what's that about? It's like a... Do you know... She, I don't know exactly the context, yeah. but she gets a veil put on her head and then gets led into his chambers or whatever. Yeah, and it's like a known symbol, I guess, because once Orinoco hears about the veil, he's like, Fuck no! Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. He, it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, is she really going out with him? That thing, but it's yeah. Like no, it's king. exactly that. Yeah. Um, is she really putting on the veil? <laughs> is she really in the king's otan, which is a <laughs> uh, seraglio, uh, where he has all of his mistresses, even including the old ones, yeah, that are there to stab in the back of the new ones. Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, so yeah. Orinoco tries to act like he's not bothered by it. Like, look, King's a king. What are you going to do? <laughs> um, it's very Sopranos. And I don't know if there's a Sopranos. It's an okay that, boomer but... moment in its own way. <laughs> um, <laughs> the generational warfare. Yeah. I think there's also, it's worth saying, this reflects ideas of, like, Orientalism and oh, yeah. <clears throat> sexuality that English audiences may have had. Ideas that English audiences may have had about you know, the exotic other... It's definitely playing the hits of, like, they have many wives and they love math. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but the <laughs> on its in its defense, it also... That's also true when you get to Suriname of... And, like, how Trelfi talks about, uh, like, oh, we got this one slave oh, girl who is so hot. Yeah. Yeah. And we've all tried, but Yeah, we've she, all tried, yeah. but I won't. I, I want to force it, but I won't. Just yeah, like, <laughs> that was one of the craziest parts of the book. Yeah. Um, <sighs> Shit. All right, well, um, they're trying to act cool about it, uh, that uh, Emoind is part of, of the king's harem. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, there's like this dance thing in the Otan because uh, they've been behaving themselves, and so everything c- kind of seems back to normal. Uh, and Orino- but um, and Emoind is doing a dance, and she falls into Orinoco's lap, and they're too happy about that, and the king gets really pissed. Yeah. Um, but anyway, they... They eventually, like, escape and, like, have sex, right? Um, and as soon as they're done, the king's men are like, hey, man. you, you was, because it, And before they do that, you find out that, um, that Amoinda did not actually have sex with the king, which yeah. is important, apparently. Important. <laughs> um, and so Orinoco feels a lot better about that. Uh, because the king couldn't get it up, I guess, is the implication. He's a uh, he's um, impotent king. Yeah. Um, well, he's more than a hundred. Yeah, and yeah, you know, he's had a good. But I mean, interesting have, to see who you're rooting for yeah, in this story. <laughs> he's doing his best. It's yeah, t- it's tough to run an Otan. <laughs> yeah, he has nine wives. Give him a break. Um, <laughs> and uh, okay, so then um, the king's men are like, hey. They come to uh, Orinoco's door to, and Orinoco's like, I'm going to kill you. Hmm. So he soon prevailed and ravished in a moment what his old grandfather had been endeavoring for so many months. Yeah. It's a very yeah. horny book, we have to mention. This is the, a ridiculously horny book in a way I appreciate because I think that we hide it in a way that's unhelpful, uh, especially when you realize how much of this is driven by horny, how much of the world is driven by horniness. Mm-hmm. Um, like... I don't know. I, like, I mean, I can't get Epstein, Epstein off the brain, basically. Uh-oh. Like, this is this is. Wait, wait. What is the connection between these two things? <laughs> the, like, Amoinda is a sex traffic victim. Oh, like, right. Basically, and like that's they they can't stop sexualizing her, um, and she becomes a sort of like prize. Okay, uh, okay. But but everyone's so horny the entire time. It's all talking about like. Um, it, like the king has his harem, mm-hmm. uh, and one of his old wives that he's off. He's not into oh, her. She's really horny. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's not into her looks anymore. So she's around there. Like, I uh, thought you were gonna make the connection between Jeffrey Epstein and Orinoco as like two <laughs> heroic figures that are also <laughs> horny. Not Which the connection I was gonna like, make. No. What? No. Uh. No. No. I don't think so. I don't know who. Th- 
the Epstein in this is uh, Afro <laughs> They're both CIA assets. So yeah, that's true. <laughs> why was why were they in that on that place? No one knows. No one knows why they were in uh, the West Indies. Yeah, how far is Little St. James from <laughs> oh, Suriname? No. <laughs> there is that weird bit as well where they like self um where they go and meet the natives and they allow themselves to be caressed by all these curious natives mm, who yeah. are like, oh, weird, white bodies. White people, yeah. Like, what is this about? And she's like, oh, I lifted my skirts for them and gave them my garter. And it is like weirdly erotic. Yeah. That moment. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the king finds out that they uh, had sex. And so he declares them both slaves. Yeah. Um, he eventually sells. Uh, oh, let's see. Doesn't the king tell him that she's dead? So, yeah, the king tells Orinoco that uh, Omoind is is put to death because he can't bring himself to tell him that she's put into slavery. Because slavery is a fate worse than death. Yeah, slavery is worse. And so uh, Orinoco gets super depressed. Um, um, And then ultimately uh, he has some battles. Basically, he takes a... A prisoner in one of those and makes him a slave but uh, his name is jamoan um but it's that depression that he has that makes him like this incredible warrior because he no longer fears death anymore so he's able to like run yeah. in the heat of battle There's and something right. of achilles about yeah him in yeah that that's moment. what i was thinking Definitely. or, or uh, i was thinking like you can't kill me i'm already dead sort of thing um, what is that from? Haven't you heard that? I don't know. If that, <laughs> like, I feel like that's a commonly like like a like a joke. The action Punisher movie novel or Punisher comic book or something. Let's see. I wonder, the incel line. Yeah. Oh, it's Renard in the world is not enough. <laughs> is that from James Bond? I'm yeah. Stick with Homer. Expecting yeah, yeah. Davidoff, nice. he caught a bolt instead of a plane. Get off. Keep your mouth shut. You can't kill me. I'm already dead. James Bond says, "Not dead enough for me." Um, oh man hell yeah what great writing speaking of spies and fiction mm. um so yeah uh um, but uh orinoco takes this slave that he really befriends named jamoan because jamoan's like a really smart guy mm-hmm. uh and, but then ultimately they get uh uh things are going along and a slave ship that orinoco commonly sells slaves to uh comes into port and uh we get this little scene Insomuch as having received a thousand kind embassies from the king, and invitation to return to court, he obeyed, though with no little reluctancy, and when he did so, there was a visible change in him, and for a long time he was much more melancholy than before. But time lessens all extremes, and reduces them to mediums and unconcern, but no motives of beauties, though all endeavoured it, could engage him in any sort of amour, though he had all the invitations to it, both from his own youth and others' ambitions and designs. Orinoco was no sooner returned from this last conquest, and received at court with all the joy and magnificence that could be expressed to a young victor, who was not only returned triumphant, but beloved like a deity, than there arrived in the port an English ship. The master of it had often before been in these countries, and was very well known to Orinoco, with whom he had trafficked for slaves, and had used to do the same with his predecessors. This commander was a man of a finer sort of address and conversation, better bred and more engaging than most of that sort of men are, so that he seemed rather never to have been bred out of a court than almost all his life at sea. This captain, therefore, was always better received at court than most of the traders to those countries were, and especially by Orinoco, who was more civilised, according to the European mode, than any other had been, and took more delight in the white nations, and above all men of parts and wit. To this captain he sold abundance of his slaves, and for the favour and esteem he had— It's interesting to me just to note the the white nations is the way that that's referred to Mm -hmm. here— and also how it, this is this is one of the more interesting parts of this book, which is that Orinoco's interest and in, like um, the credit he places in like European institutions and white institutions is actually what uh, takes him under. Yeah. Um, and then also his slave status is basically well, we'll get to that later. Had for him, made him many presents, and obliged him to stay at court as long as possibly he could. 
which the captain seemed to take as a very great honour done him, entertaining the prince every day with globes and maps, and mathematical discourses and instruments, eating, drinking, hunting, and living with him with so much familiarity, that it was not to be doubted but he had gained very greatly upon the heart of this gallant young man. And the captain, in return of all these mighty favours, besought the prince to honour his vessel with his presence, some day or other at dinner, before he should set sail which he condescended to accept, and appointed his day. The captain, on his part, failed not to have all things in a readiness, in the most magnificent order he could possibly. And the day being come, the captain, in his boat, richly adorned with carpets and velvet cushions, rowed to the shore to receive the prince. With another long-boat, where was placed all his music and trumpets, with which Orinoco was extremely delighted, who met him on the shore, attended by his French governor, Jamoan, Aboan, and about an hundred of the noblest of the youths of the court. Uh, so, just to underline a little bit, in a, like, um, uh, music and trumpets come uh, accompany the boat out to get an or- to bring an or- Orinoco to the slave ship. Mm-hmm. And after they had first carried the prince on board, the boats fetched the rest off, where they found a very splendid treat, with all sorts of fine wines, and were as well entertained as t'was possible in such a place to be. The prince, having drunk hard of punch and several sorts of wine, as did all the rest, for great care was taken they should want nothing of that part of the Keep entertainment, drinking. was very merry, and in great admiration of the ship, for he had never been in one before, so that he was curious of beholding every place where he decently might descend— the rest, no less curious, who were not quite overcome with drinking, rambled at their pleasure fore and aft, as their fancies guided them, so that the captain, who had well laid his design before, gave the word, and seized on all his guests, they clapping great iron suddenly on the prince, when he was leapt down into the hold to view that part of the vessel, and locking him fast down, secured him. The same treachery was used to all the rest, and all in one instant in several places of the ship were lashed fast in irons, and betrayed to slavery. That great design over, they set all hands to work to hoist sail, and with as treacherous as fair a wind they made from the shore with this innocent and glorious prize, who thought of nothing less than such an entertainment. Some have commended this act as brave in the captain— but I will spare my sense of it, and leave it to my reader to judge as he pleases. So that's an interesting way to wrap that up. Like, some people would applaud this. Um, it's, she kind of doesn't need to tell us what that she doesn't applaud it herself. Well, she already calls it treachery. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know why she says, like, but I will spare my sense of it. Like, I guess, spare us any more of it. She's, she, it's very clear that she doesn't, uh, yeah. She, it she doesn't seems like, it. yeah, a very self-conscious rhetorical gesture that she's making where she's like, well, make your own mind up. And right. it's pretty obvious, yeah. yeah, what we're supposed to think. So, yeah, basically, Orinoco gets uh, trapped by these the slave ship. Um, he appeals uh, his for his freedom, and the, the slavers kind of feel uh bad about it's it so weird in a weird way mm-hmm. and then all the other slaves take a hunger strike for orinoco because they they themselves feel like oh yeah i should be a slave yeah. but not orinoco yeah right. that, that 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 is that stuff is where it's like we're in complete funhouse land this guy had a hot wife yeah it's be like, here. like yeah he, i mean he's got a roman nose unlike yeah. us <laughs> so how can you have him in shackles but um, ultimately, Orinoco's like, you guys, it's okay. They said they're going to give me my freedom. Uh, it's going to be all right. <laughs> Imagine uh, the slaves on the ship being like, okay, man. Like, oh, all right. Yeah, you really think that? Huh? <laughs> Honestly, you could do like a comedic version of Orinoco where where it's like, yeah, like he's cucking the dad. Um, <laughs> Go on. <laughs> um, but anyway. Uh, s- Sounds like a restoration comedy to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So then he gets bought by this guy, Trefry, who seems like just a nice guy, a nice slave owner. Mm. Yeah. Um, nice Cornish man. He's, uh, he's very well-mannered and well-educated. Um, and so he likes Orinoco because, you know, Orinoco can speak la- different languages and stuff like that. 
uh, and then he knows about the English Civil Wars. Yeah. Um, I feel like these two characters are meant to be cut from the same cloth, yeah, that they're both from this, like, kind of... That kindred spirits. Yeah, yeah. or this, like, invisible empire of honor that they... Yeah, like seem to honor relate and to. education, yeah. culture. Yeah. yeah, the secret empire of honor, education, and uh, really hot slaves um, <laughs> that you decide not to, whether or not to sexualize or not. So here is where we get to that part um, where Trefray's talking, because Orinoco really is a big hit. Everyone's like, that is a great slave. Yeah, everyone likes it. Everyone loves that. Are we going to get to the bit where he gets called Caesar? His like slave name uh, is Oh, Caesar? yeah, he gets renamed Caesar, which is a very common name that was given to slaves. We've already seen it in The Spy. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, yeah. But um, we should also mention that apparently in her other writings, Ben had referred to James II as Caesar. Oh, really? Uh, so just another way in which Orinoco could possibly be read as like a allegory oh. i mean it is all it's about nobility yeah like definitely being brought low yeah. it's yeah. interesting with the name change in this is she maybe i was just reading into this but she seemed to suggest that his character had changed as well in some fashion that he's caesar and i'm going to refer to him as caesar now and he's very similar to Orinoco, but he's not the exact same person. Hmm. Well, and it, I mean, it, it makes sense because, like, he, like, that's, he thinks of it just as a circumstance, not an identity, his yeah. slavery. Yeah. Um, but he, it, it literally changes his name. And she seems to describe him, yeah, like, as a different identity that maybe he's not even, like, aware of. Everyone's loving, uh, Caesar slash Orinoco. Um, and Treffrey's gonna talk about how there's actually a really, attractive slave and this is one of the other this is such it's so weird how much this sort of male like um like it, we, it, in hope leslie winthrop talks about like tying jesses on that wild bird mm. this is like the same kind of energy of like they just they walk her through the community and they have their like pick of them basically, or they, they know that they can't actually like, like Treffrey, he's like at the end of this is like, and I didn't rape her basically. Yeah. And, yeah. and everyone's like, Oh, good job. Yeah. Like, um, but here, here it is. The manners of their several nations and with unwearied industry, endeavoring to please and delight him while they sat at meat. Mr. Trefry told Caesar that most of these young slaves were undone in love with a fine she-slave, whom they had had about six months on their land, the prince who never heard the name of love without a sigh, nor any mention of it without the curiosity of examining further into that tale, which of all discourses was most agreeable to him, asked how they came to be so unhappy as to be all undone for one fair slave. Trefry, who was naturally amorous, and loved to talk of love as well as anybody, proceeded to tell him they had the most charming black that ever was beheld on their plantation, about fifteen or sixteen years old, as he guessed, that for his part he had done nothing but sigh for her ever since she came, and that while all the white beauties he had seen never charmed him so absolutely as this fine creature had done, and that no man of any nation ever beheld her that did not fall in love with her, and that she had all the slaves perpetually at her feet, and that the whole country resounded with the fame of Clemeny. For so, said he, we have christened her, but she denies us all with such a noble disdain that tis a miracle to see that she who can give such eternal desires should herself be all ice and unconcern. She is adorned with the most graceful modesty that ever beautified youth, the softest sire, that, if she were capable of love, one would swear she languished for some absent happy man, and so retired as if she feared a rape even from the god of day, or that the breezes would steal kisses from her delicate mouth. Her task of work some sighing lover every day makes it his petition to perform for her, which she accepts blushing, and with reluctancy, for fear he will ask her a look for a recompense which he dares not presume to hope, so great an awe she strikes into the hearts of her admirers. "'I do not wonder,' replied the prince, "'that Clemeny should refuse slaves, being, as you say, so beautiful, but wonder how she escapes those that can entertain her as you can do, or why, being your slave, you do not oblige her to yield. I confess, said Trefry, when I have, against her will, entertained her with love so long as to be transported with my passion, even above decency, I have been ready to make use of those advantages of strength and force nature has given me. But, oh, 
She disarms me with that modesty and weeping, so tender and so moving, that I retire and thank my star she overcame me. The company laughed at his civility to a slave, and Caesar only applauded the nobleness of his passion and nature, since that slave might be noble, or what was better, have true notions of honour and virtue in her. Mm. Thus passed they this night, after having received from the slaves all imaginable respect and obedience. So I think that really underlines it, especially that l- the last line. Um, uh, Caesar only applauded the nobleness of his passion and nature, um, since that slave might be noble, or what was better, have true notions of honor and virtue in her. So, like, if she didn't have those true notions of honor and virtue, like, fine, like, rape her. Yeah. Um, but that, like, and that scene, I, like, however, you know, um, much of a Tory spy uh afro ben was including this sort of thing in uh, literature i think it's really important um for an artist to do like to just show how the understanding that we're talking about that everybody knows that this is going on that like oh you're uh, but she's a slave and you're the master why didn't you just rape her Mm -hmm. to just put that on the page and then to you'd be like well i was going to but she cried and everyone's like ha 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 ha." yeah it's it's unbelievable but it's i think very like culturally valuable Mm -hmm. to put things so stark uh and and so explicit yeah i I think she's also really exposing the hypocrisy of chivalry and the chivalric code which I I think is referenced a lot in this text and is drawing on these ideas from, I guess, the 12th and 13th centuries, um, these French romances that valorize um, courtly virtue, Mm -hmm. this Mm -hmm. idea that, like, there's a, you know, there's like a circle of knights who all share this mutual courtesy and they, they know how to treat one another, they know how to treat ladies, they know how to treat their ruler, um... And there's this line in this passage, uh, what is it, The when she's talking about Treffery, who was naturally amorous and loved to talk of love as well as anybody. That is like straight out of a courtly romance. Yeah. This idea that if you are a good knight, you're also a really good lover. You know how to talk to women about love. Um, and then she, like you say, Matt, at the end of this paragraph, just seems to totally undercut that by showing what a kind of monstrous situation this is right Mm. yeah exactly it's the mask the mask mask off moment yeah Yeah. um and so we we find out that clemony is a moinda surprise yeah Mm. um and And that's the novel right yes and that's what the novel is referred to here let's uh let's go a little bit to that because i think i do have that part and it's straight out of like the restoration stage this idea of a discovery scene or a reunion scene yeah it's very shakespearean as well it made me think of twelfth night yeah like every single comedy play where it's like actually oh, look. it is me yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it'd be so perfidious to love again after a moinder he believed he should tear it from his bosom they had no sooner spoke but a little shock dog that clemony had presented her which she took great delight in ran out and she not knowing anybody was there ran to get it in again and bolted out on those who were just speaking of her when seeing them she would have run in again, but Trefry caught her by the hand and cried, Clemony, however you fly a lover, you ought to pay some respect to this stranger, pointing to Caesar. But she, as if she had resolved never to raise her eyes to the face of a man again, Depressing. bent him the more to the earth, when he spoke, and gave the prince the leisure to look the more at her. There needed no long gazing or consideration to examine who this fair creature was, He soon saw a moinder all over her. In a minute he saw her face, her shape, her air, her modesty, and all that called forth his soul with joy at his eyes, and left his body destitute of almost life. It stood without motion, and for a minute knew not that it had a being, and I believe he had never come to himself, so oppressed he was with overjoy, if he had not met with the soleil, that he perceived a moinder fall dead in the hands of Trefry. This awakened him, and he ran to her aid, and caught her in his arms, where by degrees she came to herself, and tis needless to tell with what transports, what ecstasies of joy, they both a while beheld each other without speaking. They snatched each other to their arms, then gazed again, as if they still doubted whether they possessed the blessing they grasped. But when they recovered their speech, tis not to be imagined what tender things they expressed to each other, 
wondering what strange fate had brought them again together. They soon informed each other of their fortunes, and equally bewailed their fate, but at the same time they mutually protested that even fetters and slavery were soft and easy, and would be supported with joy and pleasure, while they could be so happy to possess each other, and be able to make good their vows. Caesar swore he disdained the empire of the world, while he could behold his amoinder, and she despised grandeur and pomp, those vanities of her sex, when she could gaze on Orinoco. He adored the very cottage where she resided, and said that little inch of the world would give him more happiness than all the universe could do, and she vowed it was a palace while adorned with the presence of Orinoco. Trefry was infinitely pleased with this novel, and found this Clemony was the fair mistress of whom Caesar had before spoke, and was not a little satisfied that heaven was so kind to the prince as to sweeten his misfortunes by so lucky an accident. Okay, so yeah, Trefry, the nice guy again. Like, oh, I thank God that putting them together. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so basically, uh, Amoinda and Caesar, uh, they're expecting a child. Um, and Caesar starts thinking, like, wait a second, like, uh, I need freedom. I don't want, or I don't want my child born into slavery. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that his, his, the question of his status becomes uh, much more pressing. And he kind of gets the runaround from the white people, and he and he he does all these sort of like feats where he, this is where he gets into the Hiawatha territory where he's yeah. like uh, killing tigers. Uh, one of the tigers has uh, he they're like you can't kill that tiger. I've already shot it like a whole bunch of times, and he shoots it in the brain with an arrow through the eye. Yeah, and it turns out in the tiger's heart there's bullets that <laughs> have already like punctured it. Like they just get stuck in the heart. Um, so it's like a satanic tiger and then he, uh, fishes for an electric eel and gets zapped. Um, but like is able to hold on to it. So he does all these like feats. And to me, it's, this is where we get into the psyop, the state psyop. Like mm. th- this is the distraction, right? He's, he's distracted with trumpets and music to bring him onto the slave boat. <laughs> he starts asking about his status and they're like, Oh, like you can do all this cool stuff, like kill tigers and do all this fun stuff for us. Um, it's also interesting how he's acting as an intermediary between the Europeans and the natives in this passage. Mm-hmm. Like he's he's the go between, or the he, he's like defending them against the environment. He's also introducing them to like Indian communities. He's a vehicle, yeah, basically, yeah. and he's yeah, like a guide. Yeah, so they go to this Native American community, a, n- a nudist uh, one, and among other things. Uh, to determine who is the like chieftain or whatever, they self mutilate, and yeah. whoever self mutilates better becomes a chief. Yeah, um, and, uh, and Aranoko will later self mutilate as well. There's yeah, like exactly. Some foreshadowing there. Yeah, uh, exactly right. And so, can I just say one more mm-hmm. thing, Matt? The I think at this point in the book you start to see a transformation of Orinoco from this idealized, Europeanized, like, classical figure, someone very highly educated and cultured, into his more, like, his sort of, like, savage nature is emerging. Mm -hmm. So we see him as a hunter, as, like, an athlete, as somebody who's, like, very embodied. And I just, I think from this point in the text onwards, it's going to be this, like, slide into corporeality and yeah. like ending with his corpse it's yeah. like Literally. well it's like it's like which track you're on if you're on the royal track you it accentuates all this part of your personality like you become more cultured right. and um, become like a war leader yeah and, but then you can put on the slave track and you become it's yeah definitely more like uh on, on the like the, the savage yeah uh, it's like his identity right. has been subsumed like mm. alex said when he gets his slave name there's yeah. actually a, a change that happens in him potentially. Right. It's interesting because I saw like all those those different activities as like an echo of like the labors of Hercules. Oh yeah, you know where it's like he proves himself in different physical ways. But in correct me if I'm wrong, but in that myth, that's on the way to him becoming uh, like a full god. A god, yeah. Right. This is like the inverse of that, like what right. you're saying, where it's like it's actually his his. Uh, way to access like this more downwardly mobile right anti-god place where yeah it ends up with him just as a corpse I he's think. like an animal yeah yeah 
All right, so let's go to the final part. Play is when this uh, this his slave status becomes an issue, and he becomes basically an abolitionist, or uh, I mean, more than that, uh, uh, insurrectionist, radical mm. insurrectionist. Yeah. yeah. She was with child and did nothing but sigh and weep for the captivity of her lord, herself, and the infant yet unborn, and believed if it were so hard to gain the liberty of two, it would be much more difficult to get that for three. Her griefs were so many darts in the great heart of Caesar, and taking his opportunity one Sunday, when all the whites were overtaken in drink, as there were abundance of several trades, and slaves for four years, that inhabited among the negro houses, and Sunday being their day of debauch, otherwise they were a sort of spies upon Caesar, he went, pretending out of goodness to em, to feast among em, and sent all his music, and ordered a great treat for the whole gang. About three hundred negroes, and about an hundred fifty were able to bear arms, such as they had, which was sufficient to do execution with spirits accordingly. For the English had none but rusty swords, that no strength could draw from a scabbard, except the people of particular quality, who took care to oil them and keep them in good order. Uh, the guns also, unless here and there one, or those newly carried from England, would do no good or harm, for tis the nature of that country to rust and eat up iron, or any metals but gold and silver. And they are very unexpert at the bow, which the negroes and the Indians are perfect masters of. Caesar, having singled out... There's your uh, critique of capitalism. Mercantilism is the only uh, medals that they care about is gold and silver. Mm -hmm. ...out these men from the women and children, made an harangue to them, of the miseries and ignominies of slavery, counting up all their toils and sufferings under such loads, burdens, and drudgeries as were fit for beasts than men, senseless brutes than human souls. He told them it was not for days, months, or years, but for eternity... There was no end to be of their misfortunes. They suffered not like men who might find a glory and fortitude in oppression, but like dogs that loved the whip and bell, and fawned the more they were beaten, that they had lost the divine quality of men, and were become insensible asses, fit only to bear, nay worse, an ass, or dog, or horse, having done his duty, could lie down and retreat, and rise to work again, and while he did his duty endured no stripes. But men, villainous, senseless men such as they, toiled on all the tedious week till Black Friday, and then, whether they worked or not, whether they were faulty or meriting, they promiscuously, the innocent with the guilty, suffered the infamous whip, the sordid stripes from their fellow-slaves, till their blood trickled from all parts of their body, blood whose every drop ought to be revenged with the life of some of these tyrants that impose it. And why, said he, my dear friends and fellow sufferers, should we be slaves to an unknown people? Have they vanquished us nobly in fight? Mm -hmm. Have they won us an honourable mm -hmm. battle? And are we, by the chance of war, become their slaves? This would not anger— So not totally anti-slavery. Yeah, that's really ambivalent, that moment, I think. For a noble heart. I mean, this would not this whole part is actually kind of problematic in a Kanye West kind of way. Like, this sounds mm -hmm. like a choice. Uh, right? I mean, am I going too far there? Like, it's mm. like, like you've become asses. You like he's kind of blaming the slaves for not having already ha like rose up again. And the first slave that has the idea to even do it is this one of like this noble like nobility. Well, I guess that's like the tension in the novel that it's like are these are these noble attributes intrinsic to him or are they gained yeah. mm. through some sort of force of effort? And that's never clear and the, to me anyways. I think the truth is if you, if we're going to look in, we might get into, uh, Afra's politics more in the widow, widow ranter episode, but she, the, the concept of the rabble is uh, mm. something she like thought of. Like she thought people were the rabble and she was very like, she's definitely, a, um, where she's not ambivalent is she's not a, de a Democrat. Mm. Basically. She's an elitist. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. She definitely believes in hierarchy. I yes. Think. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because it's not too dissimilar in uh, like kind of first jumping off point from Fuller, where yeah. she's like self, like self-improvement, self-education makes you this honorable person. But Fuller said that anyone could do it. Right. And I think Afro Ben is like saying that like you're special and unique and honorable because so most people can't do this. Yeah. And like the empire allows it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah wished us nobly in fight? Have they won us an honourable battle? And are we, by the chance of war, become their slaves? 
This would not anger a noble heart. This would not animate a soldier's soul. No, but we are bought and sold like apes or monkeys, to be the sport of women, fools, and cowards, and the support of rogues and runagates that have abandoned their own countries for rapine, murders, theft, and villainies. Mm. Do you not hear every day how they upbraid each other with infamy of life below the wildest savages? And shall we render obedience to such a degenerate race, who have no one human virtue left, to distinguish them from the vilest creatures? Will you, I say, suffer the lash from such hands? They all replied with one accord, No, 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 Caesar has spoke like a great captain, like a great mm. king. Mm. After this he would have proceeded, but was interrupted by a tall negro of some more quality than the rest. His name was Tuscan, who, bowing at the feet of Caesar, cried, My lord, we have listened with joy and attention to what you have said, and were we only men, would follow so great a leader throughout the world. But, oh, consider, we are husbands and parents too, and have things more dear to us than life, our wives and children, unfit for travel in those unpassable woods, mountains, and bogs. We have not only difficult lands to overcome, but rivers to wade, and mountains to encounter, ravenous beasts of prey. To this Caesar replied that honour was the first principle in nature that was to be obeyed, but as no man would pretend to that without all the acts of virtue, compassion, charity, love, justice, and reason, he found it not inconsistent with that to take equal care of their wives and children as they would of themselves, and that he did not design, when he had led them to freedom and glorious liberty, that they should leave that better part of themselves to perish by the hand of the tyrant's whip. But if there were a woman among them so degenerate from love and virtue, to choose slavery before the pursuit of her husband, and with the hazard of her life to share with him in these fortunes, that such a one ought to be abandoned, and left as a prey to the common enemy. To which they all agreed, and bowed. After this he spoke— So, yeah, he uh, he's able to persuade them to uh, join his insurrection, and then it ultimately fails, because most of them uh, give up on him. Um, to uh, quickly go over the rest of the plot, he realizes he needs to. Well, he in his mind he needs, he realizes he needs to kill Amoinda, uh, and then uh, take revenge. And so yeah, it ends with like a sort of murder slash, and he's he's not able to take the revenge afterwards because he's like depressed basically because he he kills Amoinda. She agrees that like oh yeah, you need to kill me. Uh, because if uh, you die, if you go on a mission and die, they'll, they'll take revenge on me. Um, so he k- slits her throat and then cuts her face off. Yep. Her face stays smiling the entire time. <laughs> and that would depress me too. I'd have, a, <laughs> I'd have a tough time going to get revenge if that happens. So yeah. he's unable to. The, uh, the men eventually come and find him and Amoinda's body. And I'll definite be- f- echoes of Othello there as well. Mm. Yeah. Well, the whole, like, noble Moorish thing is definitely yeah. all over this. Right. They capture him, and his basically only request is that they give him a tobacco pipe, and he smokes it while they hack his uh, limbs off, and he keeps smoking it until, like, quite, like, the very end without any sort of change in countenance. And uh, so very... And then his body parts are sent throughout the colonies um, and the empire uh, as, like, a... You know, we got him, sort of thing. Yeah, it's quite and the, it ends very abruptly yeah. after that, we should say. It's quite the dramatic shift in the end. <laughs> I mean, I know there's a lot of, like, there's a lot of, like, sensual descriptions and there's quite a lot of violence, but not at this level of description. It's almost, mm-hmm. like, borders on the, like, surreal. I, yeah, I read it as an instance of the grotesque, mm. um, which is this idea that, like, there are these spectacles that, elicit equal parts disgust and equal parts empathy you know it's like a weird like hybrid sensation where you don't know whether to laugh or to cry or to like throw up it's Mm -hmm. this like um kind of combination of of feelings and impulses and when you're yeah you're reading this description of just like intense bordering on the surreal like bodily disfigurement Mm -hmm. it's 
it's kind of queasy. Yeah, oh, for sure. It reminded me of the uh, beheading scene in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, too, a little oh, yeah. bit. Like, like mm. I feel like that sort of, they're just comfortable with that sort of, like, Monty Python-esque, like, hacking away at limbs and stuff like that. But, yeah. And I think, yeah, I think it underlines what you were saying earlier, Grace, about how we no it's the unpersoning of Orinoco yeah. and that, that, that theme is taken quite literally when he's just becomes a series of pieces. Yeah. You know, another, uh, uh, point parallel I want to draw is in a, the next probably story we'll do by Edgar Allan Poe, uh, which is, the, um, Oh shoot. I need to look up. It's a kind of a long time. Um, the Raven, <laughs> <laughs> um, the man that was used up. Um, it's not the man who was used up, the man that was used up. There's a, there's a ending scene there where he, uh, there's like a mutilated body. Um, so yeah. Um, anything else we really wanted to cover, um, before we wrap up here? Yeah, I just wanted to note that Orinoco had a really interesting, uh, literary and cultural afterlife. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in let's see <laughs> because Afra died short like a few years after a year after she died Publisher. one year oh, after yeah. and then uh in 1696 which i guess is uh eight years later thomas southern adapts orinoco for the stage which is interesting given that that ben herself was really a writer for the stage um and he emphasized the sort of elements of romantic tragedy in the plot and crucially he made Imoinda white whoa yeah oh god crazy (laughs) right and it became it was like in the 18th century it was regarded more as a love story than a kind of critique of slavery or you know this theme of colonialism um let me see so there was that and then in the 19th century orinoco was claimed uh for the emancipation struggle of course mm-hmm. and ben was actually compared to harriet beecher stowe yeah and seen as a precursor of rousseau as well mm. and the yeah. last thing no, in 1905 um one literary critic declared orinoco as the first emancipation novel which i think is questionable but interesting emancipate the nobility basically um the noble yeah, slaves yeah, exactly, yep. yeah. Yep. Um, well, uh, guys, I think we did a good job on this very interesting, very strange, uh, mm. I, I mean, the whole restoration period seems just bizarre to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, one th- other thing I didn't really, we didn't really stress on, uh, touch on a whole lot is how she was really reacted against for centuries as being very vulgar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And uh, so we're here to uncancel her for that. And uh, I, I also did want to make sure to cancel her for being uh, CIA. Um, <laughs> I will say that it's definitely worth reading, even if you're not necessarily into um, drama from this period. It has this like incredible, brisk, cinematic quality to mm-hmm. it. Scenic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that it's almost like... It's actually surprising it's not. There hasn't been... There wasn't, like, some 90s epic. I'm waiting for the movie. Yeah. It's... it's, hmm. But sort of dreading the movie, too. It would be terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Because you would also have to be in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in some way. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Or Noko's new Marvel character. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So, uh, um, I think that we'll we'll cover... We'll come back to Afra Ben uh, for the Widow Ranter. Um, uh, in the next, in the coming months. But, uh, Alex and Grace, I wanted to thank you. Oh, Grace, also, I wanted to just apologize that we uh, slandered you last time. Is that what we're going with? We're apologizing uh, for it now? We, if, what, what slander well, we, was there? We want to give you a chance to, well, uh, correct like, the record. Yeah, because she might know yeah. lawyers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, if you would like to comment on your education and how we slandered it. <laughs> oh no, I I mean, yeah, I, I studied yeah, I in do. Massachusetts, as Alex mentioned, <laughs> <laughs> but also in the original Cambridge. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and, uh, was there a connection you wanted to? Yeah. Interestingly, um, so Oxford and Cambridge, if people don't know, are like divided into colleges, um, which you might think of as like houses in Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is so <laughs> uh, that is so obnoxious that you fucking said that. <laughs> it's kind of like this children's book that you guys probably know about. Uh, who's the, who's the Slytherin of of uh, Cambridge? The Slytherin of Cambridge. Ooh, I would say Doctor Peter House. Okay. Oh wow. Yeah. Um, 
but the college that I went to uh, is called Emmanuel College, and John Harvard actually um, is an alumnus. Oh. So he was at Emmanuel before he sailed, and uh, the rest is history. John Harvard is such a funny name for the... Yeah. I'm John Harvard. John. Yeah. Yeah. A relation to John, Iowa, who founded <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> yeah. And John, North Dakota. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you both very much. I enjoyed this episode. I think, I think, um, I mean, just, it's kind of disorienting, uh, to go back because basically this is the other side of the Atlantic from where we've been for like, especially the Salem witch stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, did we hit that this is happening almost in tandem with the Salem witch trial? Like Cotton Mather and stuff, and Cotton and Increase Mather were writing about witches while she yeah. was writing about. Everyone reacts to the Glorious Revolution in their own way, yeah. but they're all freakouts <laughs> yeah. for the most part. I mean, basically she was the, on the opposite side of things, right? Yeah. Like, um, and yeah, so, uh, just, man. History's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and subscribe. Yeah, patreon.com slash literary hangover if you want to uh, support the show. Uh, and we will see you next time.